Uh, hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith featuring Hiron Ennis. Um, unfortunately, Gretchen Felker Martin was going to join us tonight, but she is sick. Um, so I'm going to be doing my the, be the best Gretchen impression that I can. Um, she shared her questions. So hopefully we'll be able to honor those as best we can. Um, my name is Bonnie, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a bookseller and the assistant events director at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, if you're familiar with our store, which it sounds like some of you are, welcome back. Um, and if this is the first time you're hearing about us, welcome. Uh, we're so happy to have you join our community this evening and we really appreciate your support of course, of Hiron's work and also an independent bookstore through your purchases and attendance. To introduce our author, Hiron Ennis is a writer, musician, and student of medicine based in the Pacific Northwest. Their areas of interest include, the, include infectious disease, pathology, and anti-capitalist healthcare reform. When they're not hunched over a microscope or a Word document, they can be found playing in the snow or playing the harp, though not usually at the same time, I would like to note that would be fun to see if you ever play the harp in the snow, <laughs> please share. Um, they're queer in every sense of the word and they really want to pet your dog. Um, and Leech is their debut novel. Surreal and horrifying, it defies our understanding of identity, heredity and bodily autonomy. To tell you a little bit about the book, Leech opens with a doctor from, of the mysterious institute, traveling by train to a secluded chateau in the north. Situated in the type of landscape where you might catch a glimpse of Dr. Frankenstein wandering the tundra ch chasing his monster. Uh, the chateau itself secretive and frightening is home to the Baron whose doctor has died. And the doctor we meet on the train is a replacement with mystery to solve. How did the Institute lose track of one of its many bodies or doctors? In the world of Leech, we are introduced to the inter Interprovincial Medical Institute, which has grown by taking root in young minds and shaping them into doctors, replacing every human practitioner of medicine. The Institute is a hive mind where th that exists to help humanity and is dedicated to the species survival from the apocalyptic horrors their ancestors unleashed as an assurance of its own survival. The Institute and humanity are mutually intertwined and dependent on each other. When the Institute's body discovers a competitor for its rung at the top of the evolutionary ladder, uh, the two parasites will make war on the battlefield of the body. Um, Tamsin, Weir, Ta Tamsin Weir called it uh, a wonderful new entry into Gothic science fiction. Uh, think Wuthering Heights with Worms. Um, I think it perhaps shares a sort of evolutionary path with that classic Gothic literature like Frankenstein. Um, or a contemporary horror film and TV, such as a very particular episode of The X-Files called Ice. <laughs> um, and yet it is also something entirely new and entirely its own. Um, Hiron, it's such a pleasure to have you here tonight. Everyone, please make some noise in the chat for Hiron Ennis. Thanks everyone. And thank you for hosting me. I am happy to be here in whatever sense that means online. Um, and also, I'm extending a heartfelt get well soon to Gretchen, who, instead of hosting me, seems to be hosting something only slightly more pathogenic. So get well, and I'm sorry we missed you. Um, I thought that I would start off uh, just with a real quick reading. Um, just from the very beginning of the book to get a sense for what's happening. Uh, as mentioned before, the uh, doctor belonging to the uh, institute steps off the train into this frozen town and makes their way up to the chateau that, of course, is like on a hill overlooking the, the ice-bound Arctic town. And um, they come inside to essentially perform an autopsy on one of their own bodies. And so this scene starts out where they first enter the chateau and they meet uh, the Baron's only son, Didier. He barely resembles himself. His handsome face seems to have withered in my short absence and behind the cracked glass of his pince nez, his eyes are colored with fatigue. You must be the replacement, he says. I didn't think you'd come here for another few days at least. And at this time of evening, 
Had I known you'd arrive so quickly, I'd have sent someone to retrieve you, and certainly well before nightfall. He attempts, valiantly, to smile. You must be exhausted. Come rest in the salon and I'll pour you a drink. I would much prefer to see the body first. Surely that can wait. I'm afraid not, sir. Dijay's eyes glide over mine, probing for the reasoning behind my urgency, but I have nothing to offer him. Somehow, I know even less than he does. If that is what you wish, he says, we'd lay him out in the cold, so, well, you're no doubt familiar with the process of decay. He lifts an oil lamp from its sconce and bids me follow. He guides me through the distal veins of the chateau, down creaking staircases, past rows of rooms that have not seen an occupant in centuries, to a tall, unadorned metal door. I'll get the houseboy to bring you his tools if you want to open him up. DJ struggles with the lock for a moment, but with his wound, it's not hard to guess how he died. Regardless, I would very much appreciate the tools. He nods and pushes the door open in a wave of freezing air. We step into what may have once been part of a kitchen, but now serves as meat storage. Venison and pork hangs from hooks in varying states of disassembly. On an iron butcher's table, supine and blue with cold, lies a body familiar to me. At the sight of its sunken eyes and the dark puncture wound on its neck, a multitude of voices echo in my mind, some worried, others calm, all rational. A hundred mouths whisper twice as many questions, and not for the first time in my life, though it is rare, I am at a complete loss. Who is responsible for this? I ask. I have no idea, DJ replies. Nobody had anything against him, except for my father, perhaps, but he has something against everyone and he can barely get out of bed to eat, much less drive a scalpel into someone's throat. I can't help but suspect, I suspect he did this to himself. I say nothing. I cannot confirm nor controvert his theory since I have no recollection of the event. I was not there and that is what terrifies me. I'll be back in a moment, DJ says and disappears. I take a breath quieting all my voices and inspect the corpse's exterior. I observe the blackish toes, the atrophic genitalia, the missing fingernails and molars, all expected signs of the unique condition the body carried in life. There are only two things out of the ordinary, a clean puncture on the anterolateral neck and a series of thin black marks divaricating from both eyelids. The former is clearly the immediate cause of death, but the latter may be an underlying one. DJ returns with the houseboy in tow. The silent young man hands me my bag. I would like to ask him a few questions, since in my experience, the servants often have a better grasp of the goings-on of their masters than the masters themselves, but I know he cannot answer me. I address DJ instead. Tell me what happened. Well, he starts, he fell ill about a week ago, maybe more. We didn't think much of it. I did not either. Strange, I mutter. The body's pupils shine with a disturbing color, but I do not know if it is a result of trauma, or postmortem opacification of the cornea. Images of my books open to their relevant pages appear before me, but I cannot focus on the words at the moment. These eyes are occupied. I found it strange as well, DJ continues. He was the last person I'd expect to see so ill, but he was showing his age of late. He took to bed for a few days. How many? Mm, three, I believe. My father's fit lasted as long. I reach for memories of the past week. They are filled with nights of blurred, confused malaise, consistent with the seasonal virus. I have been ill before. No human body is impervious to invasion. Time of death, I ask. I'm not sure. Emil, this fellow here, found him the morning before last at about six. He was still warm. I glance back at the servant. His dark eyes are fixed on the corpse, wide but dry. He crosses his arms, distressed events only by the one gray hand tightening to a fist over his opposite sleeve. With a sound that could turn the hardest of stomachs, I remove the body's left eye. A black, hair-like substance that I cannot identify clings to the severed optic nerve in the socket. My mind fills with theories and memories of necrosis, gliomata, masses of hair I sometimes pull from children's stomachs, but each thought dissipates as readily as it appears. Behind me, Didier squirms. I know he does not enjoy sights like these. Even when he ascends the tower to help clean his father's tubes and replace his filters, he cannot hide his aversion. After exploring the op optic canal, I manage to grip the growth with the tips of my forceps. It resists at first, but I twist, and a substantial part of the thing pulls loose. The hairs widen, meeting in a black confluence toward what must be the body of some sort of organism. I pull it from the bone and into the cold air. 
A muffled gasp escapes Didier's throat, then another quieter exhalation tumbles from a meal. A container, please, I say, as dangling black offshoots twitch at the end of my forceps. The servant fishes a file from my bag, angling it with mercifully steady hands as I place the creature inside. By the time I secure a lid over the glass and remove my gloves, it is already dead. Voices spell out caution and curiosity in equal measure. Some propose the hair-like processes are fungal hyphae. Others suggest tactile flagella, and still others are unsure, turning the pages of a thousand biological texts as they scour the breadth of my knowledge. All, however, spiral toward a similar terrifying conclusion. It appears I have a competitor. Bravo. I was clapping, but I realized my I was on mute, so you couldn't see. <laughs> um, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that reading. Um, I feel like it gives a really good sort of atmospheric sense of the, the book. Um, so uh, firstly, I want folks, before we jump into conversation, I want to invite folks who are joining us Feel free to use that Q&A box as we chat and we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, but I wanna open um, with one of Gretchen's questions um, because I'm, I'm tickled by it. Um, so she's wondering, where would you say Leach fits in relation to John Carpenter's thing and Kaufman's invasion of the body snatchers? I guess if we're viewing that as sort of a binary, <laughs> where on the binary? You know, I have a terrible confession to make, and I have seen neither. So, <laughs> okay, that's okay. I am. I feel unsure. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like the. I I will recommend. There's also um, a book version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, and I think there are a couple film adaptations, but. Um, not, not to be like that bookseller, but I, I do really like the book. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> but um, I guess that opens up uh, to a sort of more broad question, because I think that um, certainly when you read reviews of this book, you know, a lot of folks draw parallels um, to other material, like um, Tanzan's comparison to Wuthering Heights. Um, you know, I get, I mentioned that, that very particular, one of my favorite X-Files episodes of all time, which is ice, um, which if you haven't seen, it's very <laughs> scary. So maybe like, it's, it's also fine. Um, but that, of course, like there's this sort of, it points to this sort of evolutionary Gothic, uh, maybe, yeah, through line. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, because Leech stands so strongly on its own, even though many people are reminded of many different things that they've seen. Um, and so what kind of evolutionary, like liter literary threads did you kind of pull together when you were writing the book? Like what influenced you? So I think primarily like the sort of classic Gothic literature were huge influences for me, Frankenstein. I've been a big fan of Poe since I was just a, a wee one. Um, I think that like the narrative of like, I, I've always kind of been interested in possession narratives and they're usually like in the form of like, you know, the exorcist sort of like Western or, or Christian, um, very uh, unsubtle, uh, depictions of like having one's body taken over by by something else but I think that there are a lot of um, really interesting examples in in real life of, of this kind of behavior as well like um, you know like toxoplasmosis which is a parasite that you can get from cats uh, changes behavior in such a subtle way that people with it tend to acquire more and more cats um, so I think that like there always is like this through line of you know 
are people really in control of themselves? And that shows up in all sorts of literature and the X-Files and the thing and, and everything else. Um, but I also really like the, uh, I love the, the questioning subtlety about like, which behaviors are actually ours? Which are the things that live inside us telling us to do things? And I think that Leach kind of just took that to an absurd extreme. <laughs> Maybe not as absurd as we would want to believe. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yes, hopefully absurd. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting point um, too, because I think, and and uh, this connects actually with sort of one of Gretchen's other questions, um, which is like, I think horror is frequently used and, I think horror is maybe not even quite the right the right word for the book, but um, using it loosely, horror can be so many things, right? So let's call it horror as a sort of catch-all. Sure. Um, horror is often used as like a tool to explore these these more mundane phenomena in like a really often maybe a little grotesque, certainly frightening way, mm-hmm. um, and. So I guess my my question would be like talking about parasitism did the idea did you seek out to write a horror book about parasitism or did you write about parasitism and it could only be a horror book the second one <laughs> <laughs> I nice. I knew I wanted so I wanted something to you know, I wanted to write about parasitism and I wanted it to be in an alpine setting. And like, from there, you can't, you can't do anything else but gothic horror. Like I, yeah. <laughs> it's just what it ends up, ends up being. So yeah, yeah I, I think that it, it ended up being the right choice because I think that the concept of parasitism in, in both like a, a biological and a social way is really compatible with gothic horror because a lot of gothic horror is a you know it's often about like science gone too far or you know we we probed something too deeply and unearthed you know a monstrosity and that is the premise for a lot of you know horror um and then of course there's the monstrosity within and uh it, it just seemed to fall together into that genre sort of by itself. And I let it, I didn't try to steer it in any other direction. I just kind of flowed with it. I did what it told me. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, another a horrifying way of thinking about parasites when you realize you're writing what the book tells you to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> earworm but it's a brain worm and it has to wriggle out onto the page somehow so yeah I do what it says I love that way of thinking of framing like a creative impulse as like a parasitic urge that we just have to (laughs) have to do um I think that's a nice and maybe not a a comforting reframe but it is a nice reframe (laughs) Um, it's an interesting one. Um, and actually, that leads perfectly into one of Gretchen's questions, um, which uh, is, you know, uh, what do you think of, so we're talking about parasitism, and talking about that sort of monster within, and how do you, how do you view parasitism and symbiosis, not necessarily solely on a biological level, but on like a social level? Yeah. Um... I used to joke with people who uh, like early on in the days would ask me for, you know, what are you going to call the book? And this is like before it had a name. And I'm like, well, it took me forever to just decide on leech. But I I used to tell people that I think it works because it's about, it's about a parasite, a literal parasite. It's about a doctor and leech is a term for a doctor. And it's about the parasitic landowning class. So <laughs> there is a lot of, let's say, 
parallelism between the parasite itself, which uses bodies to survive, um, the institution of medicine as a tool uh, for colonialism and to serve structures of power and to perpetuate itself using both the bodies of patients and the bodies of the practitioners. And um, so I feel like a lot of parts of the book are at least somewhat parasitic um, in metaphorical and literal senses. And um, I like to refer to my dog as my favorite parasite. And there are lots of dogs in the book. Um, you might be able to call that a mutualist relationship, but my dog doesn't pay rent. And so I consider her a very, very adorable parasite. Yes, I, that's a fair assessment. I'm all Our pets are often, um, they're not, they're not paying rent. They're often just adorable parasites. Um, I love that idea too, of the, the title having these sort of multiplicity of meanings. I think Another thing that I think of is the um, the verb to leach, um, as in something leaching in the like into the water or something okay. of that um, that ilk, that kind of like insidious spread of a thing. Um, okay. It's really really very well chosen title. You did a great job. <laughs> it took um, me two years. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. You nailed it. It was worth the wait. <laughs> worth the worth the two years, two years of thought. Um, I think, so talking about um, the title and the way that it sort of evokes this very, I mean, visceral image, even if you haven't had a, a leech on you yourself, um, mm -hmm. you certainly, we all certainly, you know, it gives the heebie-jeebies. Um, it has this sort of like grotesque, uh, sort of, it's a micro dose of like a maybe larger body horror um, idea. And so I was wondering, um, as, is, as is Gretchen, um, wh what is your sort of relationship to body horror, both just in general and in how it's explored in the novel? Um, in general, I, have always kind of loved body horror. I don't know why. Uh, I love blood and guts. I love the existential terror of not knowing what's living inside you. Um, I always have. My mom uh, really likes to tell a story of, uh, you know, driving down the road with me as like a four or five year old in the back seat, and we passed like some roadkill, and I demanded to go back and examine it because. I had never seen the inside of a cat before. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah, like years of therapy later, we figured out that <laughs> maybe I should just be a pathologist and that <laughs> that's where the urge should go. Um, there you go. Yeah, but I, I feel like there is just something kind of intrinsically scary about living inside of a mutable mortal body. And mm. proximity to medicine has really uh, made me realize like how fragile homeostasis truly is and how something as simple as a misfolded protein, um, like in prion diseases, can mm -hmm. drive you fatally insane. And the, the threat is so small and so ubiquitous. And the call is, you know, with autoimmune diseases, the call is coming from inside the house, right? And yeah, it is just kind of terrifying to me to examine all of the different ways that the body is just kind of a really scary and extremely fragile ecosystem rather than like a single uh, a single organism in control of itself and mm -hmm. I know that as conscious beings we like to think of ourselves as as in control of our own actions and our own thoughts and and to a large degree we are, but there's that little percentage that, uh, that is up to chance and luck. And uh, it's a little window through which all sorts of creepy crawlies can, can get in. And uh, I've always kind of been 
super into that window. Uh, hence my uh, interest in infectious disease too. So bugs and uh, bugs and guts are like my thing. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, the the one two punch of Ely. <laughs> um, I think it's it is interesting too. Do you think that the sort of fascination with guts predated your interest in medicine and in pathology? Like, was that there before the sort of like practical application of medicine was? Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I've always kind of been fascinated with that sort of stuff. And so, you know, this is a good way to put it to use. And it takes a certain kind of person um, to to practice and it takes a certain kind of person to practice very specific types of medicine too so yeah that's definitely that's, an intrinsic thing <laughs> yeah for sure i think especially something that it it makes me think of like when you think about why guts aren't necessarily you know super appealing i think there is the the evolutionary argument of like I don't want to see that. That's supposed to be inside me. I'm not supposed to see it. Like I'm not, that's not, if I'm seeing it, something's wrong. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, and so it, it's interesting, the sort of evolutionary, uh, the, the need to su suppress that sort of evolutionary drive of, in order to ironically save a life. Right. Right. Um, and I think that is present in the book too, this sort of, the way this mutualism between the institute and the body, right, is simultaneously something is lost, but something is gained, right? Because the institute is here to perpetuate. It, it, it's interested in mutual survival, right? Um, is that something that that sort of mut mutual interest? Was that something that you had an understanding of the sort of nuance that would then become this sort of institute as a character? Or is it something that you discovered as you were writing the institute? Like which, which came first, I guess? It's, it's kind of hard to say. I think it's kind of a, a chicken and egg question because um, I knew that I wanted to have, have something that is almost a mutualist. Um, like mm -hmm. there are gains and there are losses on mm -hmm. both sides. But I think that as far as biological survival, it is a mutualistic relationship because both species benefit from this. But mm -hmm. I think where the mutualism comes into question is uh, personal agency and bodily autonomy because mm. that ends up what is being lost on the human side. And so I sort of set out to examine uh, the benefits and price of this kind of relationship and like, is it worth it? And is this intrinsically wrong just because, um, because essentially like people's agency is being violated and for the benefit of both species, like, is it worth it? Does that justify anything? Um, and I think there is, you know, a lot of exploration uh, of that in the book, because uh, the Institute itself is the narrator and it likes to justify its own actions to itself and therefore the reader, um, even though like a part of it, which has a human body and therefore a human brain, might question its own motives and question its own um, methods. Mm. So it was, it was kind of like a, it, it wasn't like one led to the other. It was kind of, I ended up having a vague idea of what I wanted to explore. And then in the writing itself, those themes sort of came out of it. And then I, I rolled with it. I did what it told me. <laughs> 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 Amazing. I it's I, I think it the the exploration of it is so sort of rich 
Um, so kudos to you for, I guess, listening to what it's telling you, but also having the skill to put what it's telling you to paper in an, in an effective way, right? Um, whatever the it is, we don't have to name the it. The it can just be this mysterious, um, the mysterious parasite of creative urge. Um, I think talking a little bit about to that, uh, the mutualism and the sort of give and take and the sacrifices that get made, what comes to mind, at least for me, is sort of like a, a more social uh, binary that we're often presented with, which is that of sort of the collective versus the individual mm. um and of course um we talked in the beginning sort of you have an interest in anti-capitalist health reform and i wonder if you see the themes in the book related to that kind of dichotomy of collective versus individual of if we want to be very binary about it, capitalism versus socialism or communism or anarcho-communism or whatever you call the other end, you want to call the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's hard. I'm not going to get into like a lot of my own personal political real life beliefs, but <laughs> I think they come through in the book, <laughs> but it's also difficult to to make direct parallels because the world is, there are a lot of things about the world in this book that are very similar to our world. And there are a lot of things that are different. And like in this world, you know, it's universal healthcare because there is a hive, a hive mind taking care of humanity, which like, not good maybe i don't know <laughs> but there's also also within that structure uh, of the institute uh just by virtue of it wanting to perpetuate itself and and keep itself alive in this world it caters to power necessarily and mm -hmm. it has to do things like send physicians to replace dead physicians that are serving like tyrannical barons and in oppressive mining towns and their the element of keeping itself alive is a grain of sort of toxic individualism I guess within mm -hmm. the collective nature of the institute itself and mm -hmm it's all kind of tangled and weird and I don't know if anything like true anything truly becomes clear <laughs> uh, in the narrative of the Institute, but uh, I don't know if it is necessarily meant to. Like the, the book is ambiguous in a lot of different ways and um, I'm a coward. Uh, so I like to play with themes and nuance and ask questions and answer none of them. <laughs> I wouldn't, I would say that doesn't make you a coward, but it makes you a good writer. Um, I think, I think asking the questions is very, is often more important than finding an answer and handing your audience an answer does the audience do a disservice um, because they don't get to come to their own conclusion. So thank you for such a, a great response to that sort of like dangerously political question. <laughs> Um, I appreciate your thoughtfulness. Um, <laughs> we have um, a few audience questions and I of course have a few of my own and Gretchen has a few more. So I want to kind of intersplice because I think I see a little nice little arc forming here. Cool. Um, so um, William asks, uh, why did you choose to write your story in first person present tense? Was it to create a deeper sense of immersion as if to give the reader the closest sense of what it means to occupy the headspace of another in the way that the hive mind does? Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's on the money. Um, I chose to, wrote in, chose to write in first person because I don't really want the reader to distinguish the different bodies of the Institute as separate entities. They're mm -hmm. all the same thing. 
and they're all this like genderless blob. So I gets rid of the gender. It gets rid of um, the the locality and uh, individual status of each each of these bodies, um, which I really don't know if if the institute could have been written any other way. I feel like first person might have had been the only the only option. Uh, mm. Present tense, I just I like the way it sounded. It was a little bit more conversational uh, because the institute tends to be very dry and very um, formal, uh, definitely a bit pretentious. And I think that uh, mentioning things in, in present tense and uh, having a little bit more of a slightly more conversational tone with the book kind of toned down the Institute's like sort of overwhelming formality of its personality and, and the way it engages with the world. Mm, absolutely. Um, that's a great answer too, because that part of my follow-up was, you know, the first person singular versus first person plural. I think it's very easy for us as human beings to maybe conceptualize a hive mind as many different minds, but at least in the context of the Institute, they certainly are just like this genderless blob, as you said, this sort of like expansive singular thing. Yeah. Um, it works really, really well, I think. Um, so we have um, another audience question. Um, Jamie is wondering if there are any themes or details that you had to cut in editing that you really loved? Um, yes. Uh, one darling that I, that I was forced to kill, that has nothing to do with any of the plot um, and so necessarily had to die, was um, the, I had uh, this whole sort of like post-apocalypse uh, music lore thing going on. So originally like, Ellen, uh, DJ's wife and the Baron's daughter-in-law uh, was not from Verdira, but was from the city. And she was like this virtuoso concert cellist. And so I had a whole subplot about her, um, like the relationships that she has with that God awful family are explored within her musical career. And it was super fun because uh, Leech is kind of like a half fantastical sci-fi, uh, a bit surrealist, post-post-apocalyptic, like fever dream. Mm -hmm. And so it was really fun to think about like, what would an orchestra look like at that? Mm -hmm. Would a cello still have four strings? What sort of a, you know, what, what staves would they use? What, what ensembles would exist and like, how would they perform? And there is this whole sort of like, I didn't get too far into it because I took out this subplot early on because I, I knew it wouldn't really have anything to do with the rest of the plot. But uh, there, yeah, there's, it was just extremely fun and interesting to think about, I think. But that was just like purely for Hiron's enjoyment and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And um, maybe in the next book, we'll, we'll see. If, there you if go. <laughs> yeah, well, it starts the book too, because if you're enjoying writing it, it makes its way into like your understanding of the world, I feel like, yeah. so which helps us understand the world. So it's like that sort of invisible sort of foundation. I think it's, it's there, even if it's not like there, there. Um, that's such a, cool like subplot i kind of want to see it yeah. um <laughs> i <miss> actually <laughs> on that on that note so uh, have you read the dispossessed by ursula Le Guin? yeah yeah quite a so, while ago, but... so something that she said in an interview someone asked her a question that was like what's one thing you want your readers to know about your book and she was like i couldn't find a way to fit it in but like in the dispossessed all of the um, towns 
on Anares, there's there's pickle barrels on every corner. And every time people are done with their pickles, or every time someone makes like a big batch of pickles, they just put the rest of the pickles in the communal pickle barrels. And I like couldn't I couldn't fit it in the book, but I want you to know that the pickle barrels were there. Um, and I, I was curious, <laughs> what was that? Utterly utopian. Yes, exactly. I was like, do you have any like little tiny detail like that that like didn't make it into the book, but that you want us to know? Uh, yeah. Um, are, actually, the twins used to have this really bizarre cat. So they're <laughs> they're, uh, and uh, it uh, it had two heads. <laughs> so amazing. They, that was just, I, I still think the cat, the cat lives in the chateau somewhere um, and it's around, but it doesn't actually show up in the narrative. So I think that the, the cat might be um, my uh, pickle barrel. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Does the cat have a name? I don't think so. I, I think it did. No, yes, it did. Its name was Pascaline. <laughs> Pascaline. Yeah. But the, the Institute never bothered to learn it. So I think that even if the cat made it in, I don't know if the cat would ever actually have a name. <laughs> yeah, but we know Pascaline is there. Pascaline. The, real, the, the diehards will know. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so that is a really fun question. And thank you for indulging me because I, I do love to, to ask, um, ask that that of, I've asked it of a few authors before and I always am delighted by the answers. I'm gonna be thinking of Pascaline for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so returning to um, maybe more the, what you were talking about before was like the, the world of Leech being this sort of post-apocalyptic, post landscape and there are all these little caveats all these little details um that maybe didn't make it into the book but are something you envision um and the sort of implication is that there's this maybe um climate catastrophe that like undercurrents that and so um and this is actually a Gretchen question um how do you use that kind of climate change as a narrative device and how does it express itself both in what you write and how you build the world more broadly? That's, yeah, that's a great question and very interesting. Um, something that has been gaining more traction sort of in the collective conscience uh, of people who work in healthcare are uh, the health outcomes of climate change and natural disasters. And mm. we are going to see the spread and perhaps extinction of diseases and um, all the little creatures that live with us. Um, all of that will change as climate does. And there's kind of this new emerging uh, sort of subspecialty, I guess, that's like climate health. And it is necessarily a part of human health, right? Because we live on a planet and uh, that planet is changing. But I was sort of fascinated with like, what kinds of absurd or terrible or occasionally uh, maybe fortuitous or interesting things will happen in the landscape of human health as a response to climate change. Cause I've read like 14 million books about how nuclear war is going to turn us all into cannibalistic mutants. And I hate that. Naturally. It's boring. <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> and, but like what, what I see less examined and what I kind of tried to have fun with in Leech, uh, for instance, in sort of the different landscapes that the doctor talks about is like mm. things like what, what would the pattern of uh, 
you know, mosquitoes as vectors uh, change about the way that we deal essentially with like their version of malaria. So the doctor occasionally goes on these little uh, side trips about the moon ague and how, uh, you know, different mosquito-borne parasites change behavior in, in patients and they live in this climate and not another climate. And in this climate, we have to worry about this whole other thing. And I think that like the landscape of climate change is going to be, in real life, it's going to be very interesting uh, in terms of human health. But in Leech, I just really kind of wanted to have fun with that and mm. sort of explore what the weird things that the climate will do will change the way that we interact with the diseases that we have. So. Mm. Absolutely. What a great answer. Thank you. Um, so actually on the, on the subject of sort of your medical experience, we have a few questions relating to that. Um, well, this first is also um, a comment, a, a bit of a comment too. So um, Dr. Brown says, uh, as a doctor, I'm always impressed how resilient and restorative the human body is despite continuous infections and assaults upon it through the course of daily life. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of relates to what, what you're saying about um, just this, the, I, I guess almost like this continuous sort of push and pull in the way we're um, both resilient and yet there's always something new to have to, yeah. to have to fight against. Yeah. Yeah. Like for every, you know, for every, every mistake in cell division that could lead to a tumor, there's like a tumor suppressing mechanism and like a whole army of immune cells that are specifically programmed to track down and, and subdue that sort of thing. And for every, well, hopefully <laughs> for every pathogen, there'll be like some, you know, industrious little white cell who happens to, uh, to find its match in the antigen and you develop immunity. And I am continuously just amazed that any, anything survives as long as it does, or that any of us actually make it out of the womb with all of our organs. And even if you're missing one, uh, it can be fine. Like I took, a, I took an ultrasound course a few years ago and we had to do abdominal ultrasounds on one another and nobody could find one of my kidneys. So I, <laughs> I went and scheduled a formal ultrasound and it turns out I have a unilateral renal agenesis. So I was born with one kidney and I never knew. And there's just Whoa. like a whole organ missing and my body seems to be doing fine. So <laughs> I don't, I, I just need to not uh, overdo it on the, the anti-inflammatories and everything should be fine. <laughs> yeah, wow. weird things like that. <laughs> you make it all the way to med school to find that you've made it there on the one kidney. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. amazing. It's, it's working hard, it's, it's a, it's a little bit bigger than a normal kidney, but it is doing the work for two, so. Yeah, powerful. Good on that kidney. <laughs> um, and actually Dr. Brown also um, was curious, are you a practicing pathologist? No, I am applying for PATH residency right now. So um, the uh, application just closed on the 28th. So I am awaiting, uh, hopefully interview requests and we'll, we'll see where I end up. But right now, um, I think that my, uh, my specific interest right now is in forensics, uh, just because I love, I love, love, love um, the ability to find out what truly went wrong with a patient and to sort of be there for the big, the big reveal and uh, to, to know what happened and, and to be, to have the privilege of, of doing an exam as thorough and intimate and revealing and uh, illuminating as autopsy is really, really great. And so I think I'm probably barreling toward that specialty, but, but we'll see. Mm, absolutely. 
And I think just the the kind of the answers that it gives both you and then also, you know, the people around the yeah. person. Um, mm-hmm. That's a powerful thing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, speaking of residency and speaking of med school, um, William is wondering how you balance writing a book <laughs> with being in med school. Um, he, they say it sounds very difficult, which I have to agree. Um, how'd you do that? <laughs> I don't know if I did. <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there are days when I uh, regret everything, but somehow, like, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> like, somehow, somehow I got through it. Um, the, I was lucky in that, like, the majority of of Leech was written before med school. And then a lot of the writing um, that I did during med school was like finishing the latter quarter and then doing a bunch of editing for uh, my agent and my editor. So a lot of the bones were already there. Um, And then this past year, I I took a research year and uh, I have been writing on the side and it's a lot easier to write when you're doing research than when you're doing clinicals in med school. So that that makes sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you was the manuscript like mostly finished when you sold it, or was it sort of still in process when like the publisher acquired it? Um, they kind of they acquired it as as a full manuscript, but they wanted revisions. So mm-hmm. accepted with revisions, essentially. Um, yeah. But they, honestly, the revisions weren't really that big. Like a lot of the structural stuff was already taken care of. And it was sort of like the muscle and skin of the thing instead of the bones. Yeah. Well, that's good. Muscle and skin. Once the bones are there, you know relatively where the muscle and skin goes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, so we do have another question in the chat that, um, I would love to, we are of course coming to an end, but I think this is a great, uh, just thought to end on, um, relating back to those little details that maybe didn't make it into the book, like Pascaline, um, and your sort of subplot, um, Mackenzie asks, are there any existing musical compositions that you associate with the world of Leech? Yeah, so I wrote this to a spooky playlist uh, that I made and it's a lot of just like atmospheric stuff. And I feel like the the most commonly listened to uh, music while I was writing Leech is definitely Arvo Pert and um, basically all of his choral stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of one in particular. I think the goodness just, just I just listened like to Arvo Parrot non-stop uh <laughs> highly recommended uh Estonian composer who just uh absolute banger after banger from this guy just a genius I love him <laughs> amazing that's my pitch well, I, that was a great pitch I'm gonna probably look that up immediately following this event um <laughs> I, on that note, um, we are, of course, coming to the end of our time, um, but I just wanted to thank you so much for an incredible conversation, um, and thank you for your grace. I know I am not Gretchen Falker Martin. I wish I was. Um, it would be cool, I imagine, um, but thank you for bearing with me nonetheless and for joining me, um, and thank you to our audience who had really amazing questions really lovely things to say in the chat. Hiren, if you haven't had a chance, there are some really nice um, responses to things that you're saying um, or emotional responses to, there is there is one nauseous emoji, but it wasn't to what you were saying. <laughs> I thought, I just want to clarify, it was to something that was gross, but it was not, it was positive. It was an enthusiastic yes and of, <laughs> of what you're saying Um, yes yes Jamie said it was a compliment so they're clarifying (laughs) right there for you (laughs) um but yeah do take a look at the chat there's some really lovely lovely comments in there um and again thank you to our audience 
um, for joining us. I'm gonna just do my little my little bookstore plug. Um, if you haven't already purchased a copy of the book and you would like to, um, there's a link that I just dropped in the chat. Um, you can order a copy through the event registration page. It's gonna be active until 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and I think we might have signed book plates on the way. I don't know, Hiron, if you can confirm that or not. You should. Um, yes, you it, signed some book plates, I would it. imagine. Yes. <laughs> cool. So um, hopefully we'll have those signed book plates um, included with your with your purchase. Um, but even if you don't buy a book, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Hiron, for this amazing, amazing conversation. Everyone is is um, really excited about past lead in the chat also right now. And I too am. I'm going to be thinking about the cat forever. <laughs> so, yeah, it's right. beautiful. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for showing up, especially Will from Japan. Thanks, Will. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right. Well, on that note, everyone, have a